I'm going to start out uh, with a basic explanation of how you can do clustering uh, and sharding. <coughs> and sharding. Um, so specifically going over horizontal partitioning, which is one way of distributing your data and sort of by extension your query load, query, because queries seek specific uh, pieces of data across your cluster. Um, so with horizontal partitioning, um, you will pick a column or a set of columns on your table, on uh, each table, and different tables can share the same key, in which case, uh, same shard key, in which case all the rows for those tables can be joined together at a single shard uh, without requiring a distributed transaction. Uh, so in my example table here, I have just columns labeled A, B, and C. Uh, and so for the shard key values for the four rows that I have, I have 0, 1, 2, and 3. Um, and so if you start by, let's say, simply round robining the rows using modulus as your hash function, um, so, uh, and you have, let's say, three partitions. I'm going to use three partitions for this example, or three shards. So the shards are IDs 0, 1, and 2. So 0 modulus 3 is 0, so that would go to partition 0. Um, 1 goes to partition 1, and 2 goes to partition 2. Um, and then 3 goes back around again to partition 0. Uh, and that all works great as a hashing mechanism for distributing your load across the cluster and your data. Um, except when you go to add a node, because as soon as you add a node or add a partition or a shard, um, you end up moving all the data if you change your hash function from to be modulus 3 to be modulus 4. And so adding that partition will require you to move all your data. So one way to get around that is to use what's called consistent hashing, where instead of uh, using modulus as your hash function, or you can continue to use modulus, um, you imagine the output of your hash function as uh, points on a ring. And so here we have the integer value at the top of the ring. So there's the minimum representable value if you're using a sign number, and the maximum representable value, assume, again, assuming you're doing a sign number, um, and then zero here at the bottom. And what you'll do is you'll place nodes or partitions on the ring in different positions. So I'm just going to space them out you know, relatively evenly. So we have 0 here, and let's say 1 here, and 2 here, and that's not at all even, but I'm just going to go with it. Um, and so then, um, if you take the output of your hash function, um, and so actually for my hash function initially, I wasn't hashing these values. I was just taking 0 as the value, and then I'm modulusing to find the location. So 0 would go to partition uh, 2 because it falls right here on the ring. Actually, no, it would go to partition 0, because I'm going right to left, or left to right, whatever. It's kind of hard, confusing, because it's a circle. So all the values in front of 0 on the ring, and in between 0 and 2, all map to partition 0. Um, partition 1 is down at the bottom. So hmm? it goes 1. Goes oh, one's, I'm sorry. Yeah, it goes down to 1. Uh, up to 0 to partition 1 uh, in this example. So 0, 1, 2, and 3 would all map to the same location, which is uh, not a terribly good distribution. So you probably don't want to use the actual value of the integer as your hash function. You'd rather do something uh, like murmur3, which is a non-cryptographic hash function. Um, it, the nice thing about murmur3 is that it has a 64-bit uh, uh, implementation that works with uh, 16 bytes at a time, uh, so, and it's done in parallel. Um, so it's good if you have large keys. Typically, shard keys aren't that large, so it's not a huge win. Um, but it's still a lot faster than cryptographic hash functions like SHA-1 or SIP hash. Uh, Distribution-wise, uh, in a distributed database, the choice of hash function isn't that important uh, because usually an attacker is not able to pick the shard key that's being used to route data or route queries. Uh, but it's something application developers have to be aware of. With a hash function like murmur3, it's possible to generate collisions even though murmur3 actually accepts a seed to its hash function. So even though it has a secret, um, it's, it's possible to generate collisions without actually uh, knowing where the hash function, or the seed of the hash function is. Um, SHA-1 is a better choice in that uh, it doesn't require a seed, which is convenient because it's less states that you have to persist and sync between uh, different parts of your cluster and clients. Um, but it's extremely slow. And then there's SIP hash, which is uh, labeled as cryptographic. Uh, it's relatively new, um, but it requires that you use a seed um, to um, 
get any security out of. Um, so those are sort of your options. So the distribution strategies you can take once you, let's say, hash zero, and let's say zero hashes to the value, um, what is it, it's, you know, negative five. So zero hashes to the value negative five, so it ends up over here on the ring. Um, and two, since I'm using a good hash function, let's say it ends up um, somewhere below long max, or whatever size value you're using. Um, so the there are a couple different distribution strategies for how you can place nodes on the ring. So one approach is random distribution, where you'll randomly allocate nodes all over the ring. Um, and so the problem there is that you can end up, you can get unlucky, and two can be right next to zero. And so then you have skew. So another enhancement to the random approach is to actually put nodes on the ring multiple times. Uh, and so this is what Cassandra has, does with its random partitioner. Uh, and I'm not aware of any other databases that are doing random partitioning. Most of them have gone with other strategies. So if they put zero around the ring multiple times and one over a few times. Um, and if you put them on the ring, let's say, eight times, in my experiments, that tends to get a pretty good distribution of the data, um, even with small numbers of shards, you know, around eight. Um, so the, another the approach is taken for data distribution is to divide the ring into a fixed number of slabs. So let's say 128 times, I'll divide the ring. And that puts an upper bound on how finely I can subdivide the data. So first of all, if I have 128 slabs and some of the slabs are actually have a lot of skew, um, I'll have limited options if I need to get up to like 128 different shards. Um, so the advantage of this approach is that there's no metadata to sync. Um, it's all easily derived. Uh, another approach is to maintain, is to try and have every region on the ring represent a fixed quantity of data. So you might start with, let's say, 16 different positions or so, and then as soon as you have, let's say, you know, a half a gigabyte of data, in between on any one of these slabs, you'll split it, and then you can move these fixed size things um, if too many of them are assigned to a single node. And the disadvantage there is that your hash function um, is now the amount of metadata associated with it um, scales with the amount of data you're storing, um, and you also have to have a place to store it, uh, and it has to be persistent. Um, so for Volt, what we're using is the random approach, where we scatter each shard across the, across the ring several times. Um, and it's deterministic, so we're using a, a random generator with deterministic seeds. So it's easy to derive in remote locations, based on the number of shards, what the hash function should be. So that takes care of hash functions. Um, Next step was to talk a little bit about um, what a Volt database looks like. Um, so in Volt DB, uh, we actually store multiple shards per node so that we can have a single hardware thread that can act independently on all the data at each shard so there's no locking or latching. Uh, and Volt DB also, also supports distributed transactions. So these shapes here, a uh, circle represents one node, triangle another node, and square another node. Um, and so in VoltDB, the way we manage distributed transactions is that there's a single global coordinator. Um, and to manage fault tolerance, the coordinator has um, other, co there are other coordinators on standby. And if one fails, we do a leader election. And then the newly elected coordinator talks to all the partitions to find out what transactions were in flight and take whatever compensating actions are necessary. Um, and so what a partition looks like uh, is that there's a master. So on the right-hand side of this box, um, I've got uh, partition one, two, and three. So it's a logical partition in this case. Um, and it actually had, is assigned to two different nodes, to triangle and circle. And because circle is on the right, I'm just going to call it the master. And all the ones on the left are slaves. And so you can see I've actually load balanced mastership so that each node is master for one partition and each node is slave for one partition so that the, uh, 
work, the workload in, in between the different roles is evenly spread. Um, and so you can see that the multi-partition initiator can send transaction requests to the master, the master can execute them, um, and the master will block waiting for a commit from the multi-partition initiator. Um, and it's the multi-partition initiator that we use to manage um, updating the hash function. I'm going to talk a little bit more about, more about that later. Um, so from a client perspective, um, a client can connect to any node or all nodes, preferably, um, and nodes will forward requests and transparently take care of replication. Um, one of the nice things involved with replication is synchronous, um, so it's not possible to have a stale read. Um, and so this, uh, this shows the client's perspective, um, where uh, it doesn't actually see the multi-partition initiator. And I'm going to get into that over here. So this triangle is sort of zooming in on just one of the nodes. Um, so you can see the triangle contains in it uh, partition 2, that it has, a mas has mastership of, and partition 1, which it's a circle, so it's actually uh, the mastership lies elsewhere. Um, and then it also has the multi-partition initiator. Um, there's actually one in all three of the nodes, so square, triangle, and circle. But the ones at circle and square are on standby. They're waiting for the failure of the existing master before they take over. Um, and so each node contains uh, what we've been calling the client interface. So the client interface takes care of routing requests to the correct partition if they weren't submitted at the correct node. Um, and it manages the life cycle of the transaction. So if a uh, transaction is submitted to a node that fails, the client interface will take care of retrying. Um, and so the client interface is what will forward uh, incoming transactions to the master MPI if the master multi-partition transaction coordinator is not at this particular node. Um, so moving back, um, back to our ring. And are there any questions so far? Any concepts that are not quite clear? All right. Um, so let's say you start out with, uh, which I call? So let's just put four things down on the ring. And so now let's, let's pretend that we're only putting each node down once. Um, so the question is, I've increased my partition count in my cluster, I've added, let's say, a fourth node, and it only has one partition. Um, so this fourth node increases the number of partitions in my system uh, from three to four. That doesn't actually do anything to change the hash function. So the uh, new partition can actually participate in distributed transactions, it just happens to have no data assigned to it. Um, so then it comes to the point where we want to start updating the hash function and moving data to it. Uh, so the first step is we have, have to figure out what kind of goal are we going to have. Um, so what state do we have to bring the ring to to actually have it completely load balanced? So let's pretend that if I put it here, that would be uh, perfectly load balanced. So this is my goal position. So I would like to drop you know, partition 4 down right here. But if I drop partition 4 down right here in my database with serializable isolation, I'm going to have to block all transactions from executing um, while the data is being moved across. Uh, one alternative implementation, uh, and this is what uh, most databases do, is that they'll ship the data and then ship a change log of any mutations that happen to happen to that data um, at, uh, while, it was in the pro while it was in transit. Um, the disadvantage is mostly from a code perspective, you actually have to write all the code to, do, to generate the change log, store the change log, ship it, and then deal with the edge condition at the tail of the log where you have to transactionally wait for it to be applied. Um, so what we're doing in Volt is we're actually just updating the hash function and taking a very small slice of data. So we might take whatever this range is here and divide it into 100,000 steps and where we think each step will move some acceptable amount of data, like let's say two to six megabytes. Um, and we'll do that in one transaction. Um, and so that means that this new partition, partition four, is going to take data from whatever was closest, let's call it partition one. So this is actually ends up being a distributed transaction. 
but it's a distributed transaction that only involves two partitions. So only partition one and partition four actually have to be involved. So that's the first part where it's non-blocking because it only involves a small chart on a small portion of your database. So in the MPI, instead of sending a transaction to all the, all the nodes, it could send a transaction to just partition one and partition four. And so then what does this transaction consist of? Well, it says, I've updated the hash function. Here's what, here's what you're allowed to do. And now you need to go send this data from one to four. Um, and at this point, the rest of the cluster doesn't even know that the hash function has been updated if the data is in flight. And it actually doesn't matter um, because we have this client interface. And so if a transaction happens to be misrouted for this tiny slice of data that we're moving, um, we can just send it back to the client interface and say, you need to try this again later. When, here's the new version of the hash function that you should be using to run it, or here's where this transaction should have gone. Uh, and this works out pretty well because the client interface already knows how to do that. All that plumbing for restarting a transaction is there. Um, so, in, so multi partition here. So two partition transaction. So then the question is, how can we make this transaction non-blocking at uh, partition one at the master and at the slave? Uh, so it's kind of uh, in Volt, the term non-blocking means a very different thing than it does in most databases. Because there's no locking or latching and everything is single-threaded, everything is a blocking operation. It just may not block for long enough that you care. Uh, at the end of the day, it's really all about your 99th percentile latency. Um, VoltDB is an in-memory database. Your data is still persistent, uh, but there's no such thing as blocking on disk read. So uh, if you pick a small enough amount of data, like two to six megabytes, that's something that you can actually materialize um, in only, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, you know, in maybe 10, 15 milliseconds. Um, so the master, for one, can shoot the data over to partition four and maintain compensating actions for the data because it's possible that the data will never actually arrive at partition four, because partition four can fail. Uh, and it has to keep the compensating action around until four actually says commit. Um, and so that takes care of one, that takes care of the blocking issue because transaction one can move on immediately. Because what we've actually done, the part of the database we've actually blocked and made unavailable is just this little slice of the hash record. Um, and so one can move on immediately because he's maintaining compensating actions to restore the data he's shipped off to four. And four can commit immediately because it's a distributed transaction. So the, the database has already committed to doing this task. Um, so four, I mentioned adding a single node at a time. You wouldn't actually add one node at a time. If you have replication, you'd actually add two nodes together. So four would actually have, I'm just gonna do a node, give it a new shape, it's star and uh, hexagon, a very poor compression of a hexagon. Um, and so, because the compensating action is still available, um, even if uh, the master here, the star, that fails, we can still materialize the data again from the master over here. Uh, and so that'll extend our, the period of unavailability of the data from this little slice in the hash rate. Um, and so by doing that, we can make only very small portions of the data set unavailable at a time and only for tens of milliseconds um, and ship the data a little bit at a time. Um, so the last trick of our sleeve, um, I'm trying to remember, totally blanking here. So any questions so far? Okay. Um, so the last, last thing I wanted to mention. Oh, yeah, one of the other interesting side effects um, is that none of this actually has to be, uh, oh, the uh, materializing the data that you're gonna move. So this is the other problem that you have, is that you may have picked a shard key that doesn't actually have an index on it, um, in which case, how are you going to um, take, find all the values that fall inside this little slice uh, within 10 or 15 milliseconds? Because we really don't want to do a lot of work at this master because that master has a lot of data 
and if it blocks to do work, like a full table scan to find a bunch of rows, it's going to kill performance and kill the 99th percentile. Um, and so this is where another feature that Volt has comes into play. So we can actually do a background scan uh, to build an index on this entire section of the data set that's at partition one. So we'll have, because we have an index, uh, and also because we're doing range scans on that index, it can actually be pretty fast to materialize uh, pointers to all the rows we're going to end up moving. Uh, and that's it. Any questions? All right. How long did I take? It's 2.15 now. 2.15. When did I start? Anything about Vol? Anyone have distributed database questions? Yeah. Huh? When you have a velocity problem, when specifically write throughput, so there are a lot of databases out there that will scale out and scale out read throughput, especially, um, but a lot of them don't scale out write throughput that well. Um, so if you have, a, if you can transform your workload to operate on a single shard which pretty much every database I've seen except for maybe Foundation DB, and even then their scale out of distributed transactions is not that high throughput uh, in comparison. Um, you really have to operate against a single shard um, if you want to actually have transactions. You could do operations against multiple shards, but not in the same transaction uh, and still get any kind of performance. So another thing that Vault offers is that you can have very complex transactions and it's still extremely fast. So for the voter benchmark on my i7 desktop, I can do 200,000 transactions a second. Uh, and in this benchmark, it's uh, inserting a row, it's doing a read, read inside the transaction. Um, and so it's also it's stored procedure based, so this is why it's fast. Because it's in memory and stored procedure based, all your data is a function call away. So you can do a read inside the stored procedure um, do some arbitrary application logic, and then you can go do a write. And so in this particular benchmark I mentioned, it does our two reads, so two index lookups. Um, it does uh, an insert into a table that has two materialized views. Each of those has an index on it. Um, so in relative terms, it's doing a lot more work than uh, most databases. So there are a lot of databases that can claim to do 200,000 transactions a second, 200,000 writes, not so much. Um, and then 200,000 writes with this level of complexity cuts it down even further. You're typically going to decompose those into multiple operations, and that really eats into your budget. Um, the disadvantage is we require that your data set fit in memory. Um, what happens with machine Oh, so it's still on disk. It's at, so the reason your data set has to fit in memory is that we don't want to have to um, block on a disk read. And the problem with blocking on disk reads is that now you have long running transactions. Now you need thread safe data structures, locking, latching, and yeah. No, those can, so the thing about disk writes is you can always background them. So the only disk write you can't background and defer indefinitely is the writes to the write ahead log, because that's what makes it durable. So. You can, you can do that. That's, the thing is, because it's a stored procedure, we can write the stored procedure to the write-ahead log before we even start executing it. Not only that, uh, it doesn't affect reads. So you can't have a write transaction holding some sort of lock or latch blocking read transactions. Um, so that's the advantage. It's, I think, primarily write throughput and the complexity of the transactions you can still use. Uh, and there's lots of interesting things you can do. Like if you don't like the relational data model, you could write a column store on top. Because the stored procedures are written in Java, so they're fast, and you get you know a real language to work with, so real libraries, etc. So that's my pitch. Um, do you have any problem with any fragmentation? 
we use a combination of, um, I wouldn't call it garbage collection. So for indexes and um, var binary, var char, var binary columns that are greater than 63 characters, um, we use a compacting allocator. I'm where really it's not Java. Oh. Java is so, so in Java, the place where you get into trouble is when you have, first of all, large heaps, um, and then you store a lot of data for the long term in a large heap. Java is actually incredibly fast uh, at young gen allocations where the allocations don't live for more than a few milliseconds because it's a copying collector. So whatever your working set is for you know, a few millisecond time span, that's what you actually pay a price for in Java GC. Uh, and so that, if your working so let's, sets... Let's see here. Oh. Let's see. You know, in Java, if you're allocating on it, you're allocating on something. Oh. Right. system, then you can fragment the memory so it's closer to your judgment. Basically. Okay, so the database, the data tables um, and indexes aren't stored in Java. They're stored. No, I understand, oh, yeah. uh, I understand that. Okay, so... I'm just wondering, if we're running over a long period of time, if the Java part of it sort of expands over the span and then you... No, it doesn't, it doesn't do that um, because it only expands and fragments um, when stuff gets promoted to the old generation because they allow fragmentation in the old generation. In the young generation, they, at least in Hotspot, the only collector available is a compacting collector. Oh, okay. Actually, it's a moving collector. It doesn't compact, it just moves everything out. So, yeah. And so the old generation has a compacting, has a compacting collector and also concurrency, concurrent marking and sweeping and free lists on top of that, or the garbage first collector. And so in that case, you can get into a lot of trouble um, because like, you can get, that's where you get into the day long pauses where you have this massive object graph that has to compact. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, you don't run with a lot of heat. So even if you ran into one of those, it's not that much. But the other thing is there's no data storage. Like the data only lives for the life of the request, and that's one or two millions at most. Um, and then it's gone, so it never gets corroded. All right. Any other questions?